When I was a child, merely being warned not to do something dangerous was not enough. Quite often, I had to learn from personal experience to stay within the boundaries of safety that adults in my life were trying to instill in me. I was curious and naive. I remember one time, uh, having been warned many, many times to be careful not to touch the stove. You don't know when the stove was turned off, so you don't just put your hand up there and touch it. One time, when I was little, I just reached up and put my hand on the stove and got a nice little swirly ring on my hand um, from the burner, the hot burners on the electric stove. From then on, I have been a lot more careful and a lot more paranoid to not touch a stove, even if you know it's been off, you still rest your hand above there to, to test it to make sure that maybe your wife didn't cook something you didn't know about or make some tea or something, and so you don't accidentally put your hand on the stove. You just generally shouldn't put your hand on the stove. And so I had to learn uh, from personal experience, just listening to the warnings of adults in my life was not enough. There are times that some of us need to learn from personal experience to, to learn the boundaries. Um, like if Samuel is talking while the preacher is preaching, that he might just <laughs> smack him in the face, right? And then he will, just joking, okay, we don't do that here. And he would learn that lesson very quickly, not to talk in church, right? Um, so, you know, sometimes we, we push the boundaries. We need, um, we need that personal experience as a way of teaching. That's, that's kind of what our job is as parents. We discipline our children, not because we're angry at them, but because we want to instill boundaries. And some of those boundaries are painful. So sometimes you need a, a good spanking to teach the physical pain that is involved with crossing boundaries. Like, if you don't listen to me uh, when I call your name and you run in the street, you're going to get run over by a car. So the spank I give you as a child will help you to realize that there is pain involved in the situation. A pain of getting run over by a car is a lot worse than getting a spank. So, you know, these things are there to teach, to, to show um, that you need to learn from experience. But more often than not, there are a lot of Things, there's a lot of boundaries in place that we ought, not to, we ought not test. We ought not try. We ought not try our luck, so to speak, with those things. Like, for example, there are, when it comes to guns, there are four primary uh, rules of firearm safety. They are four rules for a reason. Um, as, as reasonable, um, responsible people, we do not want to violate these rules because we know that if something happens something really bad is going to uh, transpire. Like, if you point a gun at somebody, you don't know it is loaded. You, you might accidentally pull the trigger because your, your fig, finger should be on the trigger unless you're ready to shoot. Uh, that's one of the rules. And so if you point at somebody, you think the gun is loaded, and you put your finger on the trigger, something really terrible might happen. And so you don't want to learn from personal experience the four rules of firearm safety. Either you will be hurt or somebody else will be hurt or killed. You have to rely on the wisdom of other people to know that you ought to follow the laws of firearm safety. And there are, other, there are other rules and laws, like I was saying earlier about crossing the street, you look both ways. That is something you just want, you want to um, have in your life. Like, I was run over by a car. I can talk about this from personal experience. I looked both ways. The car didn't. And I was the victim in that situation. So uh, there's, there's, there's definitely times you don't want to learn from personal experience. Now, in chapter 14, we're going to find some stern warnings of things that we are to avoid. And the wisdom of this chapter is going to teach us, it is going to tell us, that this is not something that we want to avoid because we learn from it from uh, personal experience. By the way, once we meet this, uh, the things in this warning from personal experience, it's too late anyway. Uh, so there is, no, there is no future learning that is going to be involved with this. We have to rely on the wisdom of others who have warned us in advance to avoid these things. It's not something that we want to engage in with personal experience. And so there's going to be, as we look at chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, um, we're going to see that there are some warnings and we recognize that there are still people who are going to choose wrongly. They're going to ignore the warnings. And there is a sober reminder that hopefully it won't be you or it won't be me. So let us go ahead and pick up in John, the revelation given to John by Jesus, chapter 14. He says this, Then I looked, 
And there was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name on and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of, a thousand, of, of loud thunder. The sound I heard was like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and for the, before the four living creatures and the elders. But no one could learn the new song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, since they remained virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were redeemed from humanity as the firstfruits for God and the Lamb. No lie is found in their mouths. They are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship the one who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another, a second angel, followed, saying, It is fallen! Babylon the great has fallen. She made the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And another angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and receives the mark on his hand or on his forehead, or on his, on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink from the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in its image or anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for endurance from the saints. Those who keep God's commands in their faith in Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the Spirit, so they, uh, yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labors since their work follows them. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud. Use your sickle to, and reap, for the time to reap has come, since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. <clears throat> then another angel who had a sharp sickle came out of the temple in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar, and he called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grape from the vineyard of the earth, because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle at the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth, and he threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Then the press was trampled outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press up to the horse's bridles for about 180 miles. This is a really wild scene that we are shown here in in Book of Revelation. There, there, there are so many different um, events happening sequentially over and over. Some of them are happening at the same time. Our eyes are here. Our eyes are here. Our eyes are everywhere. It's like makes me want to eat green eggs and ham here, there, and everywhere. Um, but there's our eyes and our attention is diverted to all of these things happening so quickly in this scene. And there, there are good things. There are, there are things of beauty and glory. And there are things of extreme terror. Towards the beginning of this chapter, we see, one, again, these 144,000. Uh, this represents new Israel. This represents the church, those who have God's seal, which is the Holy Spirit. We read elsewhere in Scripture that those who have uh, faith in Christ, they are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so... When we receive God's seal, we are a part of this 144,000. It is symbolic of New Israel. Uh, the different listing of the tribes from earlier in the book don't match the usual listings of the ancient uh, Israel. And so we recognize that there's something special, something different. This is the New Israel. 
And what is what we see is, of course, they have the seal that they they have the it, the seal of God on their foreheads. Everybody who sees them recognizes that they belong to God, and we are shown that they follow the Lamb. This is Jesus. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And I think it's, it's really awesome that Dave shared from uh, Psalm 23, the, the good shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. Uh, in, in this scene, he is also the lamb. We are the flock following Jesus wherever he should go. And we know that he is going to lead us to good places. And we know at the end of the story, there is a wedding feast that is prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. It is, it is a beautiful psalm that ties in so well to the overall uh, structure of Revelation. And so we know that this, this 144,000, this is people who follow Jesus. These are, this isn't uh, literal Israel today. This isn't physical descendants of Abraham. This is the church. These are the people who follow Jesus. But there is an odd qualifier here that says that they have not defiled themselves with women because they are virgins. Now, this is a very, very strange thing. To them, it wouldn't have been so strange, especially in light of the fact that we understand that the church is what? The church is the bride. We have been kept for Jesus, and as the church, we are supposed to remain pure and undefiled, that we don't go after the idols of this world. And we see later on in the book where the wedding supper of the Lamb is held that the wedding takes place, that the new Jerusalem comes prepared out of heaven as a bride. And so the church is the bride of Christ. They have not defiled themselves with the impurities and idolatries of this world. They have remained pure and faithful to Jesus. And this connects back to the Old Testament, where the idea uh, so often in the Old Testament, whenever Israel or Judah would go off to follow idols, it was seen as prostitution or adultery. It was, it was classified and described in the language of sexual immorality. And so uh, it makes sense that John is adopting the same uh, language of purity for the church, that we don't engage in spiritual adultery. We don't engage in spiritual sexual immorality as well as physical as we are following Jesus in this world. And so as, as part of the scene, we see this, there's a great uh, time of celebration. We hear the sound of harpists harping their harps, which is literally how the Greek says it. There's, there's an overemphasis on the musical sound of this great sound coming from heaven, and it is extremely loud. It is, it is like thunder roaring uh, from heaven. It is, it is a great and a glorious and a beautiful sound. And we see that all of these people before the throne, all of these 144,000 in the church, that they are celebrating before God. They are singing a new song. They are rejoicing in their salvation. And it says that only those who are a part of this group, those who are followers of Christ, can really learn this song. And I kind of want to be uh, a little bit sarcastic for a second. Okay, we have to learn a new song in heaven? Like, we don't like to learn new songs here on earth, so we got to learn a new song in heaven? Oh, heavens, no, please don't let it happen. Yes, there is a new song that we, and, and this really connects back to one of the Psalms where it talks about uh, a new song being sung. It is a song that we sing because we are in relationship with Jesus. It, it's a new song because it talks about the salvation that we have in Jesus that was unavailable to the Old Testament. So it is a, it is a new kind of song. It is a song that we who have been redeemed from the earth, we understand because we have been bought with the blood of Christ and those who live on this earth, who engage in all this idolatry, who reject Jesus, they can't understand, they can't know the song because they don't have that relationship with Jesus. But what we see in these 144,000 is that following Jesus, as they are in heaven, as they're following the Lamb wherever he goes, this is symbolic of us. It's not just those who have died and who are in heaven. This is symbolic of all of us in all times, in all places, that following Jesus is joyful. Following Jesus is supposed to be joyful. Uh, but when you look at many of our faces, when you look at many of the, how we, uh, the way that we talk about things or, or how we uh, are maybe are negative or, or critical, it doesn't seem that way. And maybe we, we think that following Jesus is a chore or is boring. It's not that exciting. There, there's no passion. You know, it's just real hard. 
There are a lot of rules. Even when I look at Jesus and, and all these things that he tells me to do, there are just so many commands and so many rules that I have to follow. Oh, man, it's so legalistic and it's so stifling. Like, I have all these things that I want to do, but Jesus is a great uh, party pooper. <laughs> like, he tells us, you know, he just throws... Um, cold water on our party and it's just a terrible experience and and no that's not what it's like following jesus is supposed to be a joy yes there are difficult difficult aspects of following jesus we are, are we face persecution we face difficult times in life we face death and sickness and we face discouragement we face all of these things and yes there are certain aspects of following jesus that are extremely hard like loving your neighbor as yourself or no that, that's easy when we like our neighbor. Love your enemy and pray for your enemy. That's, that's what Jesus says. That sort of thing is a lot more difficult to do. And so, yes, there are certainly hard parts to following Jesus. But even in those things, there is joy. And we ought to have such great joy. We ought to be known as people of joy. We, we have a relationship with the creator of the universe. We have been redeemed from the earth. We have been set free from the bondage of our sin. We, we, know, and we know the one who created the heavens, the earth, the streams, and, and all this like we read in, in the Psalms. We have a, a God who came to this earth and he died for us so that we could be with him forever. Not so that we could be objects of his wrath, but he took his wrath on himself for us so that we could be with him. He is with us every second of every day. He is our strength and our shield. We ought to be excited about who Jesus is. We ought to be excited about following him because he is literally the most awesome thing in the universe because he is beyond the entire universe. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, this is how it looks. Like, if you're a non-Christian... And somebody's talking to you about Jesus. And you're like, yeah, I, I go to church, and it's kind of boring. The guy just rambles on for a, a long time. The, the music kind of stinks. It's not my style. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus tells me to do these things, and it's really hard, so I don't do them. Um, you know, I, I just I can't ex get excited about following Jesus. Or maybe you just never talk about Jesus because it doesn't come up in conversation because you're not really all that excited about Jesus. If you're talking about, to a non-Christian in that kind of way, are they going to follow Jesus? Nope. Not at all. Like when you see people in, in, the, gospel, uh, uh, in the Gospels, when they, when they encounter Jesus, like the woman at the well, even though her whole, her whole life history has been exposed and she is vulnerable in and, and her immorality and, and, her, and her serial marriages and divorces, all of these things, or maybe uh, she's a widow, all, all, you know, all of her life has been poured out in front of her. Jesus knows everything. She goes back into Samaria and says, I met the Savior. Like she is really excited. Even he told me every terrible thing that I've done that all of y'all are gossiping about. She know, he knows all of that even though he doesn't live here. He knows all of that. He is a savior. And because of her testimony, the, the whole city uh, a lot of people from, from Samaria come out and they want to talk to Jesus. See, excited. Or, or you see the people who are healed by Jesus. They get up and, and like the paralytic, he gets up and, he, and he's jumping for joy because of what Jesus has done. And Jesus has set us free. has healed us from far more than just physical ailments. And so Jesus, following Jesus, ought to be a joy. There should be joy in our hearts. And if there's not joy in our hearts for Jesus, then there, maybe there's misaligned priorities. Maybe our heart isn't right. And that is something that we have uh, to, to express with Jesus and wrestle with in Jesus. And I know that all of us are passionate. Like, I've seen the passion when there's football games on, when, they're, when you're talking about a president, or you're talking about politics, or maybe talking about beauty pageants, or dance recitals, or when it's hunting season, or going on vacation. You get really excited, and you will talk for hours and hours and hours about these things. Or maybe you get angry about some of these things, and you're really passionate about those things when it comes to Jesus. Oh, so what has Jesus been doing in your life this week? Like, you know, how, what have you been reading in Scripture? Or, you know, how's your prayer life? It's the most exciting, most awesome news that we have, and we just keep our mouths shut. And that's not the church. Like the church that we see here, 144,000, they are joyful, they are celebrating, they are singing, they're, 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 they're just so excited and happy and glad to be following Jesus. So following, following Jesus in this world is full of joy. 
The next thing that we see is we see the succession of three different angels picking up, uh, looking at back at verse 6, we saw um, another angel flying high overhead. So uh, John is, is kind of like the vision is, is more centered on the earth, and he looks up and he sees these three angels flying overhead. The, the first angel is going around proclaiming the eternal gospel. He is calling uh, humanity, he's calling all nations to worship the Creator. The second angel is also proclaiming a message from God, except for his message is a little bit more dark. It is that the fate of Babylon, she is fallen. So the fate of any nation like Babylon, any government like Babylon, any, any society like Babylon is doomed to fail. And this is a, a character, uh, Babylon becomes a character in chapter 7. We're going to talk about her in a few weeks, um, that, that her fate is sealed. She is fallen and then the third angel talks about those who worship the beast, those who worship the kings and nations and all this. Any of those who go along with ungodly society, um, they are going to experience God's wrath. If you make an idol of anything, if you make an idol of Caesar, if you worship the government, if you worship the nation in which you live, you worship the Roman Empire, uh, which were, they, they literally had um, temples set up to do that stuff. If you, if you worship those things... That is uh, idolatry, and that is not permissible in the kingdom of Jesus. And it is very clear that when you do that, you are going to face God's wrath. And so th there is some good news, and there is some bad news. But overall, as we see uh, the, the angel proclaiming the eternal gospel, that it is good news. That there is forgiveness, there is grace, there is hope. For anybody who has faith in Jesus and they follow God's ways, that, that there is a way forward for them. There is a way of salvation. There is a way to get away from God's wrath. And that is by accepting Christ and being faithful to him in this life. So the, the gospel tells us that salvation is, is available, but there are consequences. When you reject God or when you go after idols, there are severe consequences when you say no to God. And if you decide to turn to anything else that is not God for your safety, for your security, for your fulfillment, any of that, if you follow after anything besides God, you will be disappointed. Like any of those who trusted in the, in the Roman Empire, that they would be severely uh, disappointed, especially when in a, in a few months or years after John writes this, that the Roman Empire in many different ways are going to turn on the church. And they had many, maybe they had compromised, maybe they had worshipped Rome. Well, Rome is going to turn and seek after them and destroy them. So they, they are going to learn very quickly. And also, in, in the grand scheme of things, the Roman Empire already hit its peak and is on its, on its downslide. And so in a few uh, relatively quick in human sc scale of human history, the Roman Empire was going to be broken apart and it's going to fail. And so there are, there are these warnings there. And if you go after these, these idols, then you are going to face God's wrath. And so that is, the gospel sums it up, is, is summed up very much. God wants you to be saved. There are consequences if you don't accept that salvation. But listen, he wants you to be saved. So, so here you have this, these terrible things, choose wisely. But as I, as I listen to these, these angels and what they're proclaiming to the earth, I think, why are the angels doing this? Why are they proclaiming the eternal gospel of Jesus? Because whose job is that? It's ours, right, exactly. Our job is to proclaim the eternal gospel. Our job, our job is to say, Babylon is going to fall, don't trust Babylon. That's, and that's a highly politically charged statement because it's, it's applicable in any nation at any point in time in history. That's the point of John, uh, John extrapolating these, th this idea of worshiping the state or trusting in the state too much, extrapolates it or puts it into this image like it is for all time and all places. So, and that's kind of, mm, that's an uncomfortable thing to have to say. If you don't follow God, you're going to fail. Um, but it is, a, it is a thing that says you can be saved from God's wrath. God's wrath is coming, so you've got to be ready. So that is our job. That is the ministry of the church in this world to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And I think the angels here are just symbolic of what the ministry of the church is. We see these 144,000. We see these angels. That these angels are, are symbolically doing what, what is being done on earth through the church. And there's kind of a wordplay going on there because angel means messenger. So it could be a heavenly messenger, it can be the church. And I think because this 
this image or this vision is more or less centered on the earth. I think it's, it's, it's earthly messengers, it's, it's the church. But when we look at rest, of, and we, we allow the rest of Scripture to influence us in this regard, because we know from Matthew 28 that the job of the church is to make disciples of all nations. And so we are the messengers sent into the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus. It's our job. It's not something that we can hire out. It's not something that we can uh, sit in our padded pews and expect God to send angels down to do the work for us. Like, that's not what God is, is saying. We are the angels to go out into every nation wherever possible. So every person has a role to play in it. Everybody's role is different. We see here one angel is doing one thing, one angel is doing another, another. There is diversity in the body of Christ, and that is a good thing. We, we have different, different responsibilities uh, for that. But all of us ought to be engaging in the mission of proclaiming the good news to anybody and everybody that we have the opportunity to do so. And I do want to say that we all have abilities that God gives us and passions that we should use for the service of Jesus. But sometimes God will call us to do things that we're not equipped for, and he will do on-the-job training. When he says, Maybe, I don't feel called, you know, a lot of people say, I don't feel called for that, or I am not gifted in that way. Well, maybe not yet, but if you step up and do it in faith, and God will enable you to do it. So sometimes we have to push ourselves, and God will help us out with that. But there are sometimes, you know, like, some people just aren't good with kids. Like, maybe that's something that, you know, if you're not really that good with kids, don't push yourself into that, um, because you'll just get frustrated. But even then, I think God can equip and soften our hearts in that regard. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of somewhat chaotic and somewhat uh, intro, introspective. What does God want me to do? What am I gifted at? But all of us have a role to play. The, the, the role of the church is to proclaim the good news of Jesus in this world. And then the very last scene, like this is, um, <clears throat> this is crazy town. Uh, when you read verses um, 14 and uh, through the rest of the, the chapter, because what we see are two different pictures of harvest. The first one, it, we see it is, it is the one like the Son of Man sitting on a cloud. And this is Jesus, tying back to other places. Uh, this is Jesus sitting on the cloud, and he's waiting for the signal. To, uh, God's going to relay the signal from the temple. This is figurative. Wait, he's, he's ready, waiting with a sickle. He, he's ready to come back. He's waiting for God to tell him to go, and he's going to go, and he's going to harvest the earth with his sickle. And, and the, the, the image there is just very generic. The second image is a lot more brutal. We see this angel who has a sharp sickle who is going to go and harvest the grapes. Now, do you harvest grapes with a sickle? Yeah, of course not. You, you take a little pruning shears or something and you cut them off. Like this is just total, the, the image is just whoosh, like scrape the whole earth bare and clean um, and throw the grapes of, of wrath into the, into the wine press where it is going to be trodden um, and great amounts of blood are going to flow over the earth. And now this, is, uh, this is symbolic and, it, and it's more or less um, the, um, the, um, the distance that the blood flows from the wine press of God's wrath is roughly the same as what the Old Testament described the, the northernmost and the southernmost part of Israel. The land that God had given uh, in Canaan to the Israelites went from Dan to Beersheba. And that was just so happens to coincide with the amount of um, distance that is shown here. Like God, God poured his wrath out on Israel is kind of what, what it's like. God will pour out his wrath whenever he wants. And so there is the warning here of, of, about God's wrath. And I think we have two, two pictures of the same kind of thing. And I think Jesus here, as he is harvesting, I think he's harvesting the righteous. And the angel is harvesting those who are uh, wicked, who are going to eternal judgment. I, I think that's kind of the scene. The, the angel is certainly harvesting those for eternal judgment. And, and, it, and again, it's figurative. It's not literal. It's not how it's perhaps going to actually play out when Jesus returns. But that is the picture that we have. So we have a, a, a really a picture of Jesus harvesting. We have people who are with God, and we have people who are facing God's wrath. But what is the point in warning somebody? Like if I say, don't run into the street, what are you warning you know, somebody, don't run out into the street, what are you trying to have that person avoid? Getting run over. So if you're telling somebody, oh, God's wrath is coming, what are you trying to help them avoid? God's wrath, right? It, it, is a, it, is, it is avoidable. God's wrath is avoidable. People can get away from God's wrath if 
You leave idolatry and sin, and you have your sins forgiven by Jesus. And so the warning is given so that people would choose the very best thing, not the worst thing that they would choose the very best thing. He's giving out all the options here. He says, like, you can, have, you can have a nice chocolate pie, or you can have a cow pie. Okay. That, that is kind of the, 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 the severity, and it, Governor Jim, Jim Justice knows a whole lot about cow pies, like, that, you know. You know that whole scene that he did? This visual, I like visual presentations, but anyhow. So, um, we have a, a chocolate pie and a uh, a cow pie. We know which one is going to taste good. That is, that is unmistakable. But the reality of the scene is that people are going to choose the cow pie. Now, we are told, like, there are two pies. One is really good and one is just dung. Like, you don't want this one, you want this one. So make a good choice. And people are so dumb, like, all of us sometimes are dumb. Like, sometimes we're just so dumb and we make the stupidest choice. Yes, I will put my hand on the stove. I'll, I'll have the, the cow pie. Like that, that does not compute. But what, what I think part of the problem is, is the wrath is so far ahead. Or maybe we minimize it, or maybe you just say that God is a whole made-up concept. Like We push it off, and we think that it is never going to happen. And so we do whatever we want, not really understanding what's waiting on the table at the other end. But the whole point is that God has something really awesome prepared for us. He wants us to invo- avoid the bad thing, and he wants us to have the good thing. And so the message of this, this chapter, of this part of the vision given by John, is that we ought to be ready for the harvest. Be ready for the harvest. And for different people, this means different steps to take. For, for Christians, those of us who are following Jesus wherever he goes, those who are 144,000 who have God's mark, who have, are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that our job to be ready for the harvest is to preach the good news. We don't leave it up to angels to do. We are the ones who go and proclaim the good news. We warn people about the judgment to come. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, meaning God, and you need to repent or face God's wrath. And also in this passage, we are told once again to endure, endure. There are terrible, hard times in this world, and and we are tempted to go after idols. We are tempted by so many sins. We must endure. We've got to keep God's commands, and we have to keep our faith in Jesus. John spells it out, or this messenger from heaven spells it out. We've got to have endurance. We have to keep God's commands, and we have to have faith in Jesus. And both of these are so hard. Because there are a lot of things that Jesus commands us that we flat out don't do. We ignore. We make excuses for how we can do it. And we say, well, you know, look at those sinful people over there doing these sinful things. And, and like, there are things in my life. There, there are logs in my, coming out of my own eye. And, and we make excuses. Oh, it's okay. You know, it's not going to cause an infection. Like, it is fine for that log to stay in my eye. Uh, but so, sometimes they're just hard. It takes work. It takes endurance. It takes perseverance to do the things that God does. Sometimes some of the things that Jesus tells us to do, we have to step outside of our political lenses or you know, whatever political party we might be a part of. Maybe we're a Pharisee or Sadducee. And we have to step outside uh, of that and, and really evaluate, okay, Jesus says this, and it doesn't fit in with a group of people that I hang out with. Uh, and that's really hard to, to, to step outside and reevaluate and to do what Jesus says despite what we're, what we're uh, supposed to be doing. And it's also very hard to keep our faith in Jesus because there are so many temptations to go after so many false idols. There are so many people who are uh, trying to get us to think that this whole Jesus thing is a myth made up, like it's, it's just make-believe. Uh, to It's a product of evolution, to that, that religion is there as, as a way of helping us cope with bad times, like all these things. And, and that's malarkey. Like it, it's, it's true. Jesus really lived, and he really did rise from the dead. It it is a historical fact. It's not made up, but it is so hard when we are attacked, when we are um, made fun of, when we are persecuted at times for our faith in Jesus. So enduring is is not easy. That's why it's endurance. Like endurance, you have to have endurance because it it is not not easy. It's something you have to work up to. For non-Christians, the the answer to be ready is is rather obvious. Like, don't wait until it's too late. God's wrath is coming, so turn to Jesus today. You don't know when the the wrath is going to come, so so be ready today. That's the whole point of warning is there's this terrible thing. You're about to walk off a cliff. Don't walk off the cliff. 
So give your life to Christ. And then there is another step, I think, for those who are maybe are, are lukewarm Christians, or maybe those who are making compromises in their faith, and maybe they're offering a little bit of incense to Caesar. Maybe they're uh, going by the, the temples in, in Corinth just so that their friends don't make fun of them. You know, maybe they're buying their meat directly from the altar of, of that God. Like, you know, they're, they're making little compromises in, in their faith. And Jesus' message to them is stop going with the values of the world. Stop bowing to idols. Stop, I would even say, stop going along with the whims of whatever uh, political alliance that you have affiliated yourself with. Follow Jesus and his kingdom only. Worship the creator of the universe. Follow Jesus wherever he goes, even when people will make fun of you, even when people will ostracize you, even when it will cost you your job, your reputation, whatever. Follow Jesus no matter what. Stop compromising and go all in with Jesus. Jesus. And so we are shown very, very clearly that the harvest is coming soon. As the grapes of God's wrath are going to be harvested, they're going to be thrown in the wine press, and they are going to be stomped. But we have no idea when it's coming. We have no idea. Because it happens at different, in different times, in different ways. Ultimately, Jesus is going to return, and there is a day of final judgment, a day of final wrath, when the goats and the sheep are going to be separated, the wheat and the tares are going to be separated, the righteous and the unrighteous are going to be separated. Like There is a day when all of that is going to happen. And so we need to be ready for that day. But we don't know when we're going to meet death. And on that day when we meet death, it's going to be too late. And, you know, looking at the Roman Empire, looking at the, the history of the Jews, God might send his wrath uh, on, in, in judgment of a particular country or, or a particular society. And we don't know who, when, why, or how that is going to happen. And so we need to be ready. No matter what form the wrath takes, we need to be ready today. So we have been warned many, many times that it is going to happen. We're going to be warned many o times over in the book of Revelation that Jesus has wrath to pour out in the world. And it's going to happen again when we start talking about uh, different bowls of wrath that Jesus is going to pour out. Like he, his wrath is real. It is sure. It is coming. We have no idea when. So we have been warned. But some of us might not take those warnings seriously. We might be told, don't touch the stove, but we have to touch the stove anyway. But we don't really want to learn this lesson from personal experience, because by the time we experience God's wrath, it's too late. But thankfully, we have a choice that we can make today, that we, we can decide, I want to be ready for Jesus' return. I want to decide to leave whatever compromising situation I'm in. I, I want to decide today to go all in with Jesus so that I will be ready. And no matter what mistake I might have made as a follower of Christ, no matter how I might have backtracked, no matter how I might have compromised, when I come to Christ and when I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me. That when I just confess, uh, he, will, he will graciously forgive me and pour out his grace on me once again. So even though people might have compromised, even though people might have gone on some wrong path, when they re repent and they turn back to Jesus, he will give grace. And so I want you to ask yourself, think about this. Am I ready for the harvest? Are you ready for the harvest? It could come at any moments. Be ready.